Thank you so much for joining me today on Just Praise Him Radio. I'm your host, Glenda Lomax, and my job is to inspire you to a closer walk with Christ. Now here's the show. Hello, believers. Welcome to the Just Praise Him radio program. I'm your host, Glenda Lomax, and the title of my message today is Trusting God as You Step Into Your Calling. And I also would I'd like to mention a few things. One, I believe right now a lot of people are being asked by the Lord to step out of the boat, and the boat is where your comfort is. That's your, you know, your home or your comfort zone, your job, wherever you are. And to step into what he's calling you to do. Many people know that God is calling them, and they know for decades or years, but they won't step in. Um, I visited a church in another state once, and I talked to this one gentleman, and I asked him, I said, I, I walked up to him and I said, the Lord tells me you're called to preach. And he said, yeah, I know. And I said, why are you not doing it? He said, because my people, he was Native American, and he said, my people would not accept it. And I said, the Lord will give you dreams and visions. He said, my people won't accept it. And so he chose his people and their opinion over what God wanted him to do. Now, we don't want to do the same thing, do we? Okay, the other thing I would like to announce uh, this week before I forget to tell you is Just Praise Him Radio is now on WINB.com, which is a shortwave station that... um, broadcast across the United States and Canada. You can also listen online anytime at winb.com. So I just wanted to let y'all know that. Okay, now, talking about somebody who ran from their calling, let's talk about Jonah. We all know the story of Jonah, right? He ran from God. He got swallowed up by a whale. I never realized until the other day when somebody said that Jonah was sent on a water walk, but he refused to go. And I never thought of that, but it's really true. God was telling him to go do something, and he said no. He didn't want to do it, so he didn't take the water walk. A water walk is when the Lord speaks to you to step out of where you are and go to a place or go to a people and do something for him. A water walk is kind of what Abraham was sent on in Genesis 12.1 when God spoke to Abraham, and he said, Leave your people and your country and your father's house and go where I'll tell you. And he's, go where I'll tell you means I'm going to tell you on the way. And I'm going to explain that in a few minutes, why it is that way, okay? Now, Jonah had a wonderful ministry in Israel, the northern kingdom. I'm sure that it was not all roses because the people were still not worshiping God as they should have been. The life of a prophet has always been a tough one. But for Jonah, his ministry did not seem that difficult from what we know anyway. He did suffer persecution, but he lived in one of the richest countries in that area for that time. Now, in 2 Kings 14.25, Jeroboam II, he restored the territory of Israel according to the word of the Lord God of Israel, which he had spoken through his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet who was from gath Hefer. And I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing these names right. Y'all bear with me. I'm a Texan. So, Now, Jeroboam did evil in the sight of the Lord. He reigned 41 years, but he was not like the kings before him. He did not at least persecute the righteous. That's a big deal to God when you persecute the righteous. One of the richest times in Israel's history, Jonah was probably doing okay. He was a preacher, but now the Lord wanted him to step into his calling as a prophet too. You can, and often, we often have more than one gift. You may be called to teach and to prophesy. You may be called to do other things. In the spiritual gifts. Only God knows exactly which gifts he's placed into you and what time they are for, okay? The Lord said, I want you to go to Nineveh and tell them they're out of line. And Jonah said, no, I don't want to go. And he headed for Tarshish, which is not where God told him to go. Now, I did some research on Tarshish, and the actual location of it has been in dispute for over 2,000 years, but there are mentions of it in the Bible. And let me give you an idea of those. 1 Kings 10.22 notes that King Solomon had a fleet of ships of Tarshish at sea with the fleet of his ally, King Hiram of Tyre, and that once every three years, the fleet of ships of Tarshish used to come bringing gold, silver, ivory, apes, and peacocks. 
And there's a similar scripture in 2 Chronicles uh, 9.21, I believe. 1 Kings 22.48 says that Jehoshaphat made ships of Tarshish to go to Ophir for gold, but they did not go, for the ships were wrecked at Ezion Geber, I guess is how you say that. This is repeated in 2 Chronicles 20.37, right after the information that the ships were actually built at Ezion Geber, and emphasizing the prophecy of the otherwise unknown Eliezer, son of Dadavehu of Merishoth, I'm saying that right, against Jehoshaphat, where he said, Because you have joined with Ahaziah, the Lord will destroy what you have made. And the ships were wrecked and were not able to go to Tarshish. This may be referenced in Psalm 48, 7, which records, By the east wind you shattered the ships of Tarshish. From these verses, commentators consider that ships of Tarshish was used to denote any large trading ships that were intended for long voyages, whatever their destination. And some Bible translations, including the NIV, go as far as to translate the phrase of Tarshish as trading ships. Just an interesting little side note there. I find biblical history very interesting. Do y'all also find that interesting? And so it appears to me from these references that Tarshish was a place of riches, such as gold, ivory, and peacocks, and a place of much commerce. So Jonah refused God's command, headed for the center of commerce instead, a place where money was and money could be made. Jonah was comfortable preaching his 20-minute sermon at every Sunday to his sleepy congregation, and he did not want to go preach to the people he did not like, the Assyrians. Nineveh was a place full of Assyrians, ones who only a generation before had raided Israel's territory, ones who only a couple of generations after this would completely destroy Israel and deport them to other areas of their empire. Jonah hated the Assyrians. They were a violent people who had a lot of hatred for other people. We don't know for sure what Jonah's intentions were in Tarshish. But we know that trip in his rebellion against God went horribly wrong. So God hits the ship Jonah is in with a terrible storm. You know, a lot of times storms come into our lives. This is not in my notes, y'all. The Lord's showing me this. Storms come into our lives to get our attention because maybe we are going the wrong way. Not natural storms so much, but maybe those too. If you live on the coast and a hurricane's coming for you, then maybe that too. But... A big storm hits your life because God's trying to say, hey, I need your attention here. You're going the wrong way. So God hit Jonah's ship with a big storm, and everybody else on board was throwing stuff overboard and praying to their gods to save them. Meanwhile, Jonah is taking a nap. Sometimes when we are least afraid is when we should be afraid, isn't it? Jonah had made a run for it, and he thought he got away with it, didn't he? But God was watching. God is always watching. I want to read you a story from Richard Riss's Evidences. In February 1891, the Star of the East, a whaling ship from Liverpool, England, was hunting whales in the South Atlantic near the Falkland Islands. A whale was sighted, and two boats were sent to kill it. The first boat successfully harpooned the whale, but it swam away, dragging the boat with it. Later, the harpooner in the accompanying boat also succeeded in harpooning the whale. Both boats were towed about three miles by the whale before it sounded or went below the surface. It came back up by the surface, and in its death throes, it capsized one of the whaling boats. All but two crew members were rescued by the other boat. A few hours later, the now-dead whale was lashed to the side of the ship, and the crew began the task of cutting it up. When they came to the stomach, they hoisted it onto the deck and were shocked to see something moving around inside. They quickly cut the stomach open and found one of the missing sailors, 35-year-old James Bartley, inside alive but unconscious. He was soon revived, but for two weeks was delirious. 
By the end of the third week, he had recovered sufficiently to go about his duties again. Sir Francis Fox wrote of Bartley, His skin, where it was exposed to the action of the gastric juice, face, neck, and hands, were bleached a deadly white and took on the appearance of parchment and never recovered its natural appearance, though otherwise his health did not seem affected by his terrible experience. So basically, layers of Jonah's skin would have been burned off for refusing to obey God. He probably had no problem commanding attention when he finally got to Nineveh because of how he looked, but wow, that was sure the hard way to get there. Nothing is more painful to heal from than burns. Remember Jonah? He fought the will of God. He was miserable in his hometown when he heard the will of God. He ran away to Tarshish and was miserable on the whole trip. When you have to hide in the belly of a ship to get away from the storm you brought upon yourself by disobedience, you're always going to be miserable until you repent and go do what God wants you to do. He was miserable overboard. He was miserable in the belly of the fish. He was miserable after being spit out on the shore. How would you like to be a seaweed sandwich with fish sauce all over you? And I don't mean tartar sauce. The only time he had a brief break in his turmoil was in the revival of Nineveh. Then he was miserable again because he still fought the will of God in his mind, though his actions had surrendered to the call. Did you know that? You can surrender your actions, but your mind fight against it every step of the way. That is not a good thing because God's looking at the heart. He looks at the inner man, right? A man is, is not miserable doing the will of God, and a woman isn't either, okay? A man is miserable outside the will of God. The safest place to be is in the center of the will of God, even if it is in the worst of external circumstances. The most dangerous place to be is in the lap of luxury, rebellious to the will of God. Can I just tell you that? If you are God's child, he is intent on you following his clear direction or you will face consequences. His direction leads to peace. The opposite direction leads to a veritable hell on earth, basically, like having your skin burned off. That's just in Jonah's case. By the way, anytime you are considering stepping into God's will and purpose for your life, Satan will always be sure to send Job's friends to your house. So watch out for this so they can give you some, quote, advice. Some of Job's friends may even be members of your family. You will notice, oh, I hear y'all laughing. You will notice that often none of them have ever done a thing for the Lord's glory, but they are happy to offer you their unsolicited advice on what you should do or not do, aren't they? Let me offer you a clue about this. Theirs is not going to be the advice you need in order to succeed on a water walk. If the Lord speaks to you to step out of the boat, he will send whatever and whoever you need along the way. Notice I did not say they show up before you step out of the boat. Okay, now, the water walk being when God says, okay, I want you to go here or I want you to go there and do this or do that or say this. That's a water walk because you're stepping out on nothing. Instead of staying in the comfort of your boat where you have everything you need, he's having you step out and walk on water. Okay, and, and you, have no, you have nothing in your life that shows you you're going to be able to walk on that water, do you? It was very similar when God called me, by the way, many years ago in 1996, I believe it was, that God called me to preach. And my mother had five children, and she prayed that one of us would become a preacher. She never told us she was praying that, but she prayed one of us would become a preacher. All five of us would have bet money that it was not going to be me. Can I just tell you that? We would all bet. I would have bet the most money. It's not going to be me because I was running the other way from Jesus as hard as I could. And he still got me. So there you go. Don't give up praying for your lost loved ones because he'll get them in the boat. He will get them there. Okay. Water walks are for increasing your faith. They are also for the purpose of giving you a mighty testimony that brings God glory. Okay. In future episodes, I'm going to be sharing with y'all some of these testimonies of miracles of provision and things like that that God did for me. And I'm also going to have other people in the program that God did miracles for them. So I don't want y'all to miss that because it's really encouraging to hear about answered prayers like that. Because all of us are just regular people. 
We're nobody special. I'm definitely nobody special. Anytime the Lord is increasing your faith, he never, ever sends everything you're going to need for the trip up front. Please hear me on this. This is so important. Because if you're one of those people that God says, okay, I want you to go do this, and you say, okay, I need this and this and this, and I'm not moving until you bring it all, oh, you're going to have a rough journey. You are going to have a hard journey. Can I tell you that? Because that's not the way God works. You know why? Because you don't need any faith to believe for what you already have. The whole point of a water walk is to teach you to believe day by day by day for what you need and to believe God to provide it and to understand at the end of that water walk that he truly is the provider that he says he is and he's going to come through every time. Okay? All right. It works kind of like this. The Lord says, I want you to go to Nineveh. You get on a boat and you go to Nineveh. Then he supplies what you need, usually a little at a time along the way, starting with, okay, here's your boat ride to Nineveh. You know, whether it's your boat or somebody else's boat. He provides along the journey. On that trip where you're going on this water walk, Satan will also send things. He will send people to try to tempt you into sin if you have any inclination to sin that way. He will send distractions to get you off track. We're all subject to distraction. And he will drop thoughts in your mind that you did not hear from the Lord to go and you just made it all up. Oh yeah, he will. Because if he can get you into doubt, you're not walking in faith, right? Doubt's the opposite of faith. So God brings faith, Satan brings doubt. The Lord is not going to make these go away. You have to deal with the people, you have to deal with the thoughts, and you have to deal with the distractions yourself as a normal part of your walk, because when you work for him, these may come and go from your life pretty regularly, sometimes every day. As you are stepping into what you are called to do, Maybe your job ended and you realize from the way it ended and how the Lord has been drawing you in your spirit that he wants you to step into your calling. So you start getting ready. And here come Job's friends. And very often you will also endure family attacks. You'll get called a fanatic, you know, and people will just think you're just downright crazy because you're not out searching for a job because God's telling you he's got a job for you. And that happened to me, by the way. Um, The reason is because you're not following the, quote, normal path of, you know, life or success. And you have to die to all that. You have to just let that go and not think about it. Keep your eyes on Jesus and keep moving forward, okay? Because I'll tell you something. Working for him is the happiest life there is. It's so fulfilling and you have so much peace because you know he's got you in his hand. He's going to provide for you because he's shown you again and again and again. It's just really nice. Now, granted, if your goal is to become a millionaire and live in a sprawling estate, it's probably not going to work for you because that's not really what he's about. But this life is so much better, y'all. Around this time, your worldly friends will usually desert you. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Sometimes the enemy will hit you with illness or the need for surgeries at the same time. Anything to delay you or stop you from stepping into your calling and doing damage to the dark kingdom. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Remember when this happens, the word of God says, the mouth of the upright shall deliver him. Do you know what that means? It means you quoting scripture promises over your situation will deliver you from the circumstances that are coming against you. If illness is coming against you, quote healing verses. By his stripes, I'm already healed, Satan, so take a hike. The Lord said he would take sickness away from me. He said my prayers avail much and I'm praying for healing. There is no weapon that can stand against the power of the word of our mighty God. Your answer to every situation is in the Bible. You just have to go find it and speak it out until the answer comes. There is no sickness, no hopelessness, no lack or poverty he cannot fix. God can bring you the money to pay all your bills by sundown tonight. The question is, do you have enough faith to believe him to do it? Because that's what it hinges on. He wishes above all else you would prosper and be in health. Lack is not his will for your life. Y'all, I've been in this walk for, let's see how long, 27 years I've been in this walk. And the only time I've ever come close to lack was when I was in the wilderness. There was a very hard wilderness of 2009, 2010. And the reason that happened is because the Lord wanted me to write a book about it. And I did. So that was for the body of Christ. And I still did not, I mean, I didn't starve. I didn't get kicked out into the streets. I just had to live really lean for a while. 
Okay, now, so the scripture promises in the Bible are your weapon against everything. The mouth of the upright shall deliver him, okay? There is no weapon that can stand against the power of the word of God. Your answer to every situation is in the Bible, but you have to go find it and speak it out until your answer shows up. There is no sickness, no hopelessness, no lack or poverty that God cannot fix. God can bring you the money to pay all your bills by sundown if you have enough faith to believe him. A lot of people criticize the story of Jonah, saying there's no way it could be true. But I don't think it's any more unlikely than God parting the Red Sea. And I believe that with all my heart. I found a story about a, about a girl who met someone who did not believe the story while she was traveling. Let me read you the story. This is cute. A new believer was on a plane with a well-educated intellectual man. He sneered at her reading the Bible and asked if she believed it. Like, do you really believe that? She said, yes. He said, Jonah and the whale story? She said, yes. He said, how did it happen? She said, I don't know, but I'll find out when I get to heaven. And he said, what if Jonah's not there? And she said, then I guess you'll have to ask him for me. <laughs> I love that. That is from uh, Galaxy Software Sermon Illustrations, 10,000 Sermon Illustrations. I think that's so cute. The bottom line is to step into what God has called you to do, you need to obey. You need to know the word and you need to not assume that you're already doing your calling like Jonah did. God may have more than one calling for you. Obey when he says to go. When he says go, go. Save yourself all the unpleasantness of being swallowed up by a big sneaky fish and vomited back up. That's so undignified, okay? Know the word. You're not going to do much of anything for the Lord without knowing his word. That's a prerequisite. Don't assume you're already doing everything God has called you to do. In case you have not heard, there is a shortage of laborers in the harvest field, so you may be assigned extra duties. We all might get assigned extra duty in this time. But you will also receive extra rewards for doing those. Remember all that Jesus did for you. You wouldn't be headed for heaven if he hadn't done what he did. Do we not all owe him everything that we can do to help spread the gospel in our lifetimes? Whatever other skills or resources you need to do your calling, the Lord either made sure you learned them in the past or he will send someone alongside to teach you. Y'all, I did not know how to even record a video when God called me to do this. And then one day he goes, I want you to get on YouTube. And I'm like, how must be, you know, like, how do I even do that? But I did it. And I didn't know, I did not know how to edit audio. And God sent amongst my friends someone to teach me. And she spent two hours with me one day on the phone teaching me how to edit audio. And God bless her for doing that. You can count on him. He has had this plan for your life for thousands of years. He's just waiting for you to step into it. And then you will know the greatest peace you have ever known. And working for him is so much nicer than getting up every day like I used to a long time ago. I used to get up every morning at like 4.30, 5 o'clock and do makeup and do hair and put on pantyhose and high heels, which are horribly uncomfortable, and wear suits every day to work because that was what was required when I worked in Dallas. That's what usually is required when you work in a big city. This is so much nicer. I mean, when you work for God, a lot of times you can just work in your jammies if you want to, if you work from home. Who wouldn't want that, right? I mean, I don't work in my jammies. I'm not in my jammies now, just so y'all know, but I'm just saying. Okay. So I just want to tell y'all, I'm very excited about being on WINB shortwave and reaching so many more of you across the U.S. and Canada. On Just Praise Him Radio, most of the time I'll teach a practical application of scripture, like what the Bible says we should do, but how to do it, and I break it down. Or I teach on how to break curses off your life, such as generational curses. Um, I teach on the power of words things like that, and I will sometimes talk about prophecy. I have a website, www.justpraisehim.today, where I post prophetic messages from the Lord about things that are coming for anyone who's interested. And if you want to hear a, a teaching on any specific subject, you're welcome to email me and ask for that. If I'm able to teach on it, I will. The Lord has given me several books to write. Uh, I wrote on the Wilderness Experience. That book is called The Wilderness Companion. You'll probably hear an ad about that at the end of this show. I wrote about breaking uh, generational curses off your life. Loosed from Chains of Darkness is the name of that book. And I wrote on Betrayal because the Lord asked me to. Those books are all available on Amazon.com. 
and through the website www.justpraisehim.today. I feel very privileged to be able to speak into your lives. At the end of this program, there will be information on how to contact me. If you have a serious prayer request or something like that, feel free to send it. Until then, thanks for listening. Jesus bless you. May God greatly, greatly bless you and those you love. And may he save all the people that you love. Y'all have a great week. Thank you so much for tuning in today to Just Praise Him Radio. I hope this has inspired you to a closer walk with Christ. You can contact me by mail at my new address, JPH Inc., P.O. Box 854 Altus, Oklahoma. That's A L T U S, Oklahoma 73522. Or by email at wingsofprophecy at gmail.com. JPH is not affiliated with any nonprofit organization, church, or denomination. Listen to Just Praise Him Radio on WINB, 4 p.m. Eastern on Sundays and 9 p.m. Eastern Thursdays each week. Does your life feel like it's falling apart around you? Are multiple things going wrong all at once? Does it seem all your comforts have been stripped away? You may have entered the wilderness. Wilderness experiences are often times of great discomfort and lack. Every Christian must pass through the desert on the way to their promised land. Find out how to go from surviving to thriving by partnering with God as He leads you in the path that will strengthen your faith and prepare you to step into your destiny. The Wilderness Companion will help you find out why you have been led into the wilderness. Find out the biggest hindrances to receiving the provision you need in the wilderness. Find out what the seven temptations of the wilderness are. Learn how to partner with God in His purposes for you in the desert seasons. Get your copy of The Wilderness Companion today. The Wilderness Companion by Glenda Lomax on Amazon.com in print, Kindle, or audiobook. If you ask anyone you know what the most difficult experience of their life has been, many will answer about a time of betrayal. All those called to walk the narrow path will, at some point, encounter Judas. How will you respond? Do you know how to recognize Judas when he shows up in your life? Can you keep Judas from bringing destruction to your life and ministry? How can you minimize what Judas cost you? Can you pass the test of absolute betrayal? Get your copy of The Judas Test, available in print and new audiobook. The Judas Test by Glenda Lomax, available now on Amazon.com. Sold out for 30 pieces of silver? In Exodus 21, 32, it is the price of a dead slave. In Leviticus 27, 2-7, it is the price of a live one. Jesus was sold for the price of a bondservant. Precious Jesus, the Son of God the Prince of Peace, the King of Kings? Why did Judas sell his friend out so cheap? Are there areas of sin in your life you just can't seem to overcome no matter how hard you try? Many people live their whole lives under curses without understanding they can be free. Learn what the scriptures say about curses and why they are still relevant today. Hosea 4.6 says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Learn how to defeat every curse through the power of the cross of Jesus Christ. If you have the knowledge, you can break curses off your life and start experiencing breakthroughs like never before. In the book, Loosed from Chains of Darkness, you will learn the basics of four different types of curses. Loosed from Chains of Darkness is the most comprehensive curse-breaking book on the market today. Get your copy of Loosed from Chains of Darkness by Glenda Lomax, available on Amazon.com in print, Kindle, and audiobook versions.